Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. In our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Nicholas Bloombergen, who died recently at the age of 97, and he won a quarter of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1981. Half the prize was divided jointly between him and Arthur Leonard Schwalow for their contribution to the development of laser spectroscopy. The other half of the prize was given to Kai Siegbond for his contribution to the development of high-resolution electron spectroscopy. Those of you who listen to this program know that physics is not my strong suit, but let me try and explain Dr. Bloombergen's work. Electrons and atoms and molecules have fixed energy levels according to the principles of quantum physics. When there are transitions among different energy levels, light with certain frequencies is emitted or absorbed. This allows atoms and molecules to be analyzed with the help of the absorbed light spectrum. In the 1960s, Dr. Blombergen used laser light, which has waves in phase and of the same wavelength, to determine energy levels with great precision. By coordinating three laser waves, a fourth laser wave was created, and a larger part of the spectrum could be covered. So much of Dr. Blombergen's work has to do with lasers and their utility in everyday life. Piggybacking on the work of Dr. Charles Towns, the 1964 Nobel Prize winner in physics, whose podcast we've done. Well, Dr. Blombergen was Dutch, and here he tells the story of growing up under the Nazi occupation in the Netherlands. A little bit of trivia, he graduated from the municipal gymnasium as the valedictorian in 1938, and he gave his speech in white tie and tails. Forty-three years later, he wore exactly the same suit to accept the Nobel Prize in Stockholm. Well, I, I like to uh, read, uh, and I always like challenges. So, I, in fact, I chose to study physics because I found it the most difficult topic in my uh, gymnasium, the Latin school I went to, the Utrecht, yes. where I was born and raised. It's still a difficult topic, but I'm fascinated by the very curious correspondence between mathematics and physical phenomena, and that mathematics can describe so many phenomena with such accuracy. I passed my uh, final qualifying exam. After that, the only thing to get a doctor's degree, you have to hand in a thesis and, and do independent research, but I passed all the formal examinations uh, in early '43, two weeks before the German occupation forces closed down all Dutch universities. But I was at an enormous advantage at that time because the, all the students had to decide whether to sign a declaration of loyalty to the occupation forces or else they would be transported as forced laborers to Germany, not in concentration camps, but nevertheless forced laborers. And I didn't have to make that choice because legally, after having passed all the exams, I was not f legally a student anymore. I got on my identity papers a little stamp that I belonged to the fire brigade of the university. Okay. I had to protect the buildings, purely a formal advantage. Well, my father uh, went by bicycle uh, uh, with a little cart to get potatoes f to feed his family. And he traveled for 50 kilometers or more. And then he exchanged objects for food. Did a wonderful job keeping the family alive. Because young men couldn't uh, be in the streets, they would be picked up. I, ha I hid the last, the, we call it the, the, the hunger winter, the 44, 45, when the uh, uh, offensive of the Allied uh, near Arnhem, they didn't succeed to cross the Rhine there, so uh, they had to wait till the next spring. Here he talks about how he came to Harvard after the war. My, uh, clearly Holmes was in ruins, and it would be very hard to do significant research at the Dutch university uh, immediately after the war. So at the suggestion of an older brother, uh, he said, why don't you write to some uh, American universities? And that's what I did. He uh, chose three universities where I knew significant research was going on, but I decided those on the basis of the Journal Physical Review of 1939, because those were the last issues available in the Netherlands until 45. And uh, I picked three of them, and in retrospect, they were all very good choices. 
I picked the University of Chicago, University of California in Berkeley, and Harvard University. University of Chicago never answered my, my letter. So after about a month, I received a letter from the University of California in Berkeley. They said they would uh, like to admit me, but as long as the war was going on, they couldn't take people who were not American citizens. And uh, then two weeks later, the bomb on Hiroshima exploded. Harvard said, uh, just send some more letters of recommendation and copies of documents. And, and that's what I did, and they admitted me. It turns out I've stayed there almost ever since. His early work actually provided some of the data that helped us develop the MRI, which we talked about with some of our other Nobel Prize winners. Well, I, I've been lucky that uh, the, the two topics uh, that fields of interested me have both led to very important applications. In the case of nuclear magnetic resonance, the thesis data in, in my thesis concerned what is called nuclear magnetic relaxation in, in liquids and, and, and also so, some solid materials. But most importantly, we measured the relaxation time of protons in water, in aqueous solutions, uh, the influence of viscosity and temperature. Those data are now the basis in which I, MRI pictures can be taken because the nuclear magnetic moments of protons which are in water molecules, more than 70% of the body is yeah. water, uh, they measure small differences in relaxation time between, uh, you know, healthy cells and tumorous cells and, and, and in blood vessels. And uh, uh, so we are, uh, uh, my data were really very basic. To a, an application I didn't foresee, nor did my thesis supervisor, Purcell, we, in fact, nobody had an idea that MRI would come even as late as 1960. Um, my, my teacher, that, Purcell, yes, yeah. Yeah, he, he shared the Nobel Prize with Felix Bloch mm -hmm. in 1952 mm -hmm. for the uh, work on nuclear magnetic resonance in condensed matter mm -hmm. uh, in, already in 52. I feel, uh, you know, that uh, Mina was fully deserved, but I did a lot of the hard work and the data taking. And then later, when I got the Nobel Prize, I know that my students and <laughs> graduate assistants uh, did a lot of the work to help me get the prize. Okay. These were not big teams in the sense of, of you know, of high machines. They were small groups, but of course there are a lot of uh, rather tedious laboratory uh, procedures that have to be carried out, and that is often left for the graduate students, professors being too busy. Here he talks about the work he won the Nobel Prize for. The second item was going into optics and especially nonlinear optics, which is the behavior of light and the propagation of light in media at very high light intensities. Those and high intensities are only available from laser sources. So I, I was uh, really interested in what one can do with lasers. The lasers uh, are heavily used in surgery and in optical communication systems. Those are the two large-scale applications that affect many people everywhere in the world because uh, the optical fiber communication systems make the world very small. Mm -hmm. We can now email to, it to anybody anywhere in the world. We can uh, dial up the World Wide Web and all this information flows uh, over large distances under the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, it's necessary to uh, other points on the Earth. And then there are smaller and, and a little more trivial ones. Supermarket, checkout counters, you know, you have a code on, on each article, it's read by a little laser. Another, uh, which seems rather trivial, but is very important, is to use laser beams and straight lines over long distances. They are used to lay uh, pipelines, including trivial things like sewer lines, but of course all the major oil pipelines and gas pipelines, they are all laid out by laser beams. And any big building that goes up, the verticals and horizontals are all checked with laser beams. When the construction industry is very light, spread used to. Several years in the early 60s, my colleague Art Shalo, with whom I shared a prize in 81, he said the laser is a solution looking for a problem. He had a sense of humor. And, and that, that was really true. 
and all the applications really came gradually in, in, in the next decades. Here he talks about his work with lasers on the strategic defense initiative. I, I was uh, advising government committees on the use of laser beams, trying to shoot down intercontinental missiles. Soon thereafter, we realized that that would be very difficult. And then 20 years later, in 1981, President Reagan instituted the Strategic Defense Initiative. The idea was is to put lasers in the upper atmosphere, uh, or just beyond, in, in space, and try to shoot down incoming missiles, supposedly. Mm -hmm which might be fired by the Soviet Union. The American Physics Society said, we are going to make a scientific study of the issues involved, and then we'll come out with a public report. And they, they selected uh, 14 or 15 people, and I and Kumar, Kovoy, Kumar Patel were co-chairmen of that committee. And the reason these people were chosen is because they had never gone very open in public of what their political opinions were. We were not supposed to give any political opinion, just a scientific, purely scientific evaluation. Initially, I really thought maybe there are certain things I don't know because they, they have been kept secret. And, and maybe there is something that might make the strategic defense in initiative possible. But we found that it was not the case. Even in the 20 years that have since passed, almost 20 years, 15 years, everything is still valid all we said. What we are worried about now of trying to shoot down a single intercontinental missile from a terrorist group or from a rogue nation. Even that is still very hard to do and the, the method they pursue now doesn't involve lasers. Dr. Bloomberg also opined on working with young people in science, the involvement of the public and the importance of Einstein. Oh yeah, I mean that uh, the only way to uh, not go to sleep at old age. No, th th that is very important to, to have this. That's, I think, the most important aspect of this meeting here in Lindau, that there are all these young people to, to interact with too. I mean, I, I get a given occasional lecture like I did yesterday here, and mostly on the history of a scientific topic. Well, it's very important to take opportunities uh, to involve the public the science and the centenary of Einstein papers is certainly a worthy excuse to uh, focus attention on scientific efforts. But um, Einstein wrote a popular book, Einstein and Infeld, and I forgot the title. I read it in German, and it was originally written in German. I was in, in high school, the gymnasium, mm -hmm. and uh, that fascinated me very much. And he explained in simple terms the ideas behind uh, relativity. But you have to ask them, what would you do without uh, computers, without the World Wide Web, without, uh, you know, cell phones and so on. And as always, we'd like to get the final advice for young scientists from Dr. Bloomberg. Well, the, the, the first thing they need is curiosity. If they are not interested in trying to get an answer to a question they have, post for themselves, or somebody else has posed to them, if they're not interested in, and are not curious to find an answer, don't go into science. And also don't go into science unless you have a strong perseverance, because uh, science is really usually only a few percent inspiration, and the rest is perspiration. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps, and in honor of Dr. Nicholas Blomberg. I thought we'd do some Dutch rock and roll, and I'm going to close with my favorite Dutch rock group, Shocking Blue. Most of you may know them from Venus, but their follow-up, Mighty Joe, which wasn't as popular, was a better song and had a better bass line. So to honor Dr. Blomberg, and here's some Dutch rock and roll with Shocking Blue and Mighty Joe. <laughs> Thank you.